internet has transformed the way business is done in india the indian e-commerce market is expected to grow to 200 billion dollars by 2026 the number was 38.5 billion dollars as of 2017 Much of the growth for the industry has been triggered by an increase in internet and smartphone penetration. For India's internet industry to realize its full potential, it needs supportive government policies, better infrastructure for widespread internet connectivity, adoption of digital technologies, and innovative and motivated workforce. Today in this session, we have CEOs of successful companies in the internet sector. and it gives me great pleasure to welcome them to this session a very warm welcome to all of you i would also like to say hello to viewers please share your questions for the panelists using the chat tab they will be happy to take your questions the pace of digital transformation is creating a skill gap in the workforce the hard truth is no matter how experienced or educated your workforce is they need to skill at a continuous pace for a continuous growth momentum in your organization i would request amitav and maithili to share an overview on skill gap in your industry first we'll go with you maithili thanks puja and um, hello everyone very happy to be here today and looking forward to a good discussion the next 45 minutes puja like you rightly said i think the uh, market and the industry has completely changed for everybody post covid i think two key things that we are seeing is one is the digital transformation that everybody is going through and uh, second is the hybrid work model i think these two things are very cornerst- are the cornerstones of what has happened the last one and a half years i come from a bpm industry it bpm industry and as you may know that the bpm industry largely recruits freshers who are graduates Uh, at the entry level and uh, if i look at the uh, industry overall uh, totally it employs about 1.4 million people and recruits about 80000 to 120000 people every year and these are freshers and largely they do work which is uh, data curation services as well as the voice uh, type of services which is a call center type of work but this industry is also characterized by about a very high attrition which is about 40% attrition but because covid has brought in this uh, uh, digital transformation across all organizations what is happening is that the entry level jobs in this industry is getting automated so you know uh, in, in the voice of the call center business lot of the initial part of the calls the simple part of the calls are being replaced by chatbots so the l0 l1 l2 l3 type of calls l0 and l1 is getting automated and is being taken over by chatbots and only the more complex ones are coming to the people in the voice voice call center side at the data services side there is automation happening because of digital transformation uh, the simple jobs are being replaced by bots uh, you know many organizations have started reporting their you know the skills human skills and bot skills the number of humans they have and number of bots they have and uh, it's getting replaced by rpa robotic process automation ai and learning systems uh, business process as a service has come in all of this means that the people at the entry level who are doing simple jobs have to move up the value chain and get into work which is a lot more complex highly skilled maybe even judgmental type of work Uh, that they need to do so this requires a complete rethink in the way we reskill the people and the way this industry itself looks at talent amita over to you uh thanks pooja uh, hello everyone uh nice to meet you all uh, our industry which is a logistics industry uh faces two challenges number one is you know this industry started undergoing a transformation around 10 years back with the advent of e-commerce in the country and e-commerce quickly grew to be one of the biggest revenue source and one of the biggest uh, consumer of logistic services what it meant was you were addressing a completely different set of audience which is much more digitally enabled and you know the 
kind of services, it was for the first time the logistics industry was being tasked to not only deliver goods, complete the transaction at the doorstep. What you mean by complete the transaction at the doorstep is collecting cash and delivery. In case of refusal of goods, bring back the goods which were not being consumed. So bring it back safely and quickly back to the origin so that they can be re-injected into the supply chain. Third, if you are if you have bought something which you do not like, if you are trying to return it, how do you return it? And, and while you are returning it, the consumer wants the payment upfront. You know, he wants, as soon as he returns the good, he wants the payment to be credited back into his wallet. So it also requires the logistics service provider to do a quality check of the product. Once that it, it's like, you know, once you buy something from the shop, you go back, they do check the goods before they accept it back and give you payment back. Here, the logistics services was required to do a complete quality check at the doorstep of the customer before returning back. Plus, there were other allied services. Sometimes we were doing identity checks. Sometimes we were doing, you know, try and buy, where like, you know, customer wants to order a couple of things, try and keep one and so on and so forth. So it brought forward a lot of new challenges. And that required a lot of digital tech, digital intervention. This was A, at the crown level. B, at the supervisor and at the senior level, the people from traditional logistics industry were not used to running a very complex database services. So the number of here, prior to that, the logistics industry used to measure itself against the tonnage that they used to carry. New age logistics companies measure themselves against the number of transactions, number of parcels they carry. Okay. Whereas in a previous industry, up somebody might be carrying a huge amount of tons. Maybe he sees sending out parcels for delivery to maybe 5, 10, 15 locations. Now, in a city, you might be sending as high as 100,000 parcel out for delivery on a single day. That makes it much more complex. So you start using a lot of data, a lot of analytics, a lot of other parameters, data parameters to start checking the service quality. Previously, checking the service quality used to be on phone. It was easy. You start measuring NPS, for example, net promoter score. How good is your service? So this requires a complete paradigm shift, not only for the last mile boys, but also for the management who run such organization. That's number one. Second, how the pandemic affected is because we work on the ground, you know, there was a lot of churn because there was situations where people were certainly migrating back to their hometowns. We had to take in fresh people on the field Post the first wave of pandemic, almost 80% of our workforce changed. The nature of work did not. We were still doing those step QC. We are still doing, you know, COD delivery. We are still returning back. So how quickly, and when I say 80%, I am talking of 80% of probably in our company, 80% of 25,000 plus people. Okay. So how quickly could you change or could you train 20,000 people, 20,000 people who were not working before. And anyway, our industry is used to seeing huge high churn, but pandemic was, was a watershed moment. So we have to resort to not only a lot of stand-up training, stand-up training should be typically stand-ups in the morning where we brief them. Initially, when they come to one or two days, they will have uh, maybe we'll ask them to shadow somebody. Then every morning we have briefings, but we also extensively used uh, technology. We have our own app for delivery. We have integrated learning management system in the app. We started publishing a lot of short videos. We had a lot of short videos, but we started publishing a short videos. We started publishing a lot of training on the apps because our entire operation is paperless. So we are delivering million parcels a day. There's not a single piece of paper in the office. Yeah, Amita, so, we'll come back to you about how you are, you know, upskilling your workforce. Um, I'll just go to uh, Sargveer and Nitya. And uh, the question for you is, uh, some part of your workforce is more impacted than others on account of tech disruption. Like Maithili already told us, you know, that bots are taking over human jobs. So there is some section which is more vulnerable to disruption than the other. 
So understanding their reskilling needs is a business imperative. What has been your strategy to identify skill gaps, intervene at the right time, and keep the workforce up to date with future skills? Nitya, we'll start with you first. Yes, absolutely, Pooja. Uh, thanks for having me here, and good to meet everyone. And excited about this chat. As we think about um, this this topic of uh, tech disruption and how do you think about um, having a workforce in the team who can deliver value to the customer. Um, in our case, if you think about it, uh, we we sit in the intersection of payments, uh, e-commerce, and a rapid digitization that is happening across the board. And as a startup, we always love tech disruption because that's, that gives us the competitive advantage over the incumbent. But as an industry as a whole, when you have technology penetrating in a consumer's life very, very quickly, uh, the biggest challenge that you have is not technology itself, but making technology human-centric, packaging technology, productizing it, making the user experience uh, such that consumers are ready to take it um, very quickly. And, and that is where, um, as we, I mean, as, as a company, we, we have very highly skilled engineers, data scientists, technologists, uh, product managers, designers, and, and from a technical skill, skill point of view, obviously things are moving fast and most folks are smart and driven and motivated to keep on learning new skills. But what sometimes, you know, we have to be very deliberate about is be very human centric about it, right? So which is where, how do we make sure that everybody in the organization, whether it's engineers, designers, product managers, uh, operational people, uh, team members as well, are, are problem solvers, um, are critical thinkers. Um, and, and one thing I think is under um, maybe discussed, especially in technology is, is as consumers adopt technology and, and use your product and products, uh, technology products in general, there is an anthropological element to, to how consumers behave. Uh, and, and having an appreciation of anthropology and like, in the end, you're not dealing with a robot uh, who, 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 who will take in your code. You are dealing with a human being, which is very complex and people are different um, also. And, and how do you take your technology and, and, and really deliver a delightful user experience that people want to take in? Uh, so um, one thing that we try to encourage, and it's, it's really, it's both hard at the same time, uh, easy, uh, you know, how do we encourage, uh, you know, next level of thinking, not, not only technology first, but, but human first, people first, consumer first. Uh, and we do it through, you know, there's really no, not, nothing you can read and, 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 and kind of watch uh, as far as courses are concerned. But what you can do is, is move people around a little bit uh, so that people understand the whole system. People understand that the consumer is interacting with your, our product uh, this way, this way, and this way. And all of that put together cohesively is the most important thing as opposed to a particular thing. Uh, so, so, you know, that's kind of like the, the interesting thing that we are seeing. Um, for example, payments, uh, as you know, uh, even in e-commerce, 70% of payments in India are still done with cash. Uh, as Amita was talking about, uh, you know, uh, logistic partners have to take cash. And, and why do people use cash? Despite the fact that we have bank accounts, UPI, debit cards, et cetera. And it's really a habit. It's really a habit that, you know, and there are these underlying uh, factors that creates that habit around trust and so on. And, and the question for any technology product now is, is how do you change that? How do you, how do you instill that emotion in the customer that you can trust something? And, and therefore that, that anthropological critical thinking ability, uh, product for sense, designing, and taking all these approaches to kind of like really deliver a uh, value proposition is, 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 is the most challenging thing uh, that we see right now uh, and in the future. Very interesting, Nitya. Um, Sarabhveer, over to you. Hi, hi Pooja and hi everyone. Uh, good to be here. Uh, I think, uh, you know, a lot has already been said. So I'll, I'll just maybe focus a little bit on the, what we saw from a practical aspects of some of these gaps and uh, you know, uh, so so we are actually a large employer. We we our team is uh, about seven thousand people, uh, of which about six thousand people are really sales. Most of them are sales advisors, and there is a service component, of course. And then we have uh, you know uh, the rest of the people are in you know various technology product 
you know management etc so if you kind of break break whole, the whole covid period down right it's been different for different people uh, and i think as nitya was explaining you know everybody is a human first right you have to look at the person rather than just the role that they play in the organization uh, and all of us went through a lot you know some more some less but everybody it would be fair to say went through a period of high stress and 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 what we found was that you know there were different periods so i think the first two three months were where i think everybody really did their best and were really you know on the ball every day and i think we were all probably working you know 14 15 hours and sort of feeling that this is the only thing we have to do in life right uh, and and that gave way to a period when you know people kind of got tired of the whole thing there was a release part of it and and, and so on and so forth and and i think the the gaps that emerged uh, from a if i were to now come back to the topic of training the main issue that started happening was that initially it felt wonderful right we all said that work from home is a fantastic thing uh, agents are being able to sell policies service policies there's nothing better than this why didn't we do this earlier right people made uh, we you know proclamations about how we'll never come back to office and things like that and then slowly you know the reality started to sink in right and people uh, you found that for instance um, uh, you know learning about products we realized that there was a lot of learning that happened on the floor right where you learn from your uh, colleagues from your uh, you know uh, team leaders etc it was just by osmosis it was not really necessarily a, a training program that was teaching you and now how do you replace that learning with you know something which is effective you know you know sort of offline you know remote medium the second thing that started happening was that in the beginning when we used to send out videos for people to watch or you know that became the preferred mode of you know sending material uh, it it was working extremely well people were watching the videos they were learning they were you know again being able to uh, answer questions you know so all the various loops that you would have were working very well but again two three months down the road all that stopped working people essentially st- ignored the videos they had enough of the whole video business and they just were not able to change their habits so so one of the tangible thing that we saw was that whatever was happening just kept happening so whatever products were selling only those would keep selling because people would just not have the time energy inclination or whatever to switch from their habit and learn a new habit uh, so i think as as these uh, events happened we realized that there is you you have to mix up the whole thing how do you get through to the person you have to appeal to some form is to emotion uh, some form is to reason through whether it's incentives and things like that and finally there is also the stick right you have to also remember that some people stop pulling their weight because they feel that they you know it's easy to hide right in a uh, in a work from home con- uh, construct and you have to remind them that you know uh, you know you are letting down the team and there's you know an element of that so so i think for us the the experience changed as we went along uh, we realized that you know there there are real challenges in uh, remote training in being able to uh measure uh, and the most important difference that we realize is that what you know in theory how do you actually do it in practice is an extremely hard thing so yes i know about health insurance plans but when i talk to a customer uh i have no you know way of being able to take my knowledge to the to the to real life because earlier what would have happened is i would have gone on sort of training calls i would have seen my colleagues act uh, you know my my trainer may have just prompted me at exactly the right moment that now you know you need to say this all of that was much harder to do in an offline setting uh, so yeah i think uh, you know i'm just just giving you a flavor of some of the some of the points and of course you know we have evolved strategies around these i think uh, we developed hybrid models where we brought in some people from time to time you know uh, others obviously continue to work from home uh, you know we created differentiation amongst people so the other thing that you know that i always say that we cannot treat people equally we can treat people fairly so you know if if you are not a performer then maybe you need to come in maybe you need to you know do that extra training whereas on the other side if you are someone who is doing extremely well uh, maybe you don't need to come in so so i think we have to sort of uh, and in an organization you know these things are hard to do because the first instinct is that i have to be the same with everyone right i should not treat people differently uh, so i think these were some of the practical challenges uh, that that came up and of course we've devised some solutions and uh, perhaps maybe later on in the discussion we can talk about this amita you were talking about the disruption in your industry and very nicely and vividly you explained you know how logistic industry started this disruption journey 10 years back and now today where things stand and the world economic forum's future of jobs report also says 50% of all employees will need reskilling by 2025 
and you know what you've told about your industry actually shows that coming to be true so what kind of learning ecosystem are you developing in your organization you had already started talking about a few of those uh, aspects i just request you to continue on that so that workers can learn continuously they have both formal and informal channels to learn what digital tools are you using for their continuous learning so uh, pooja our industry or overall e-commerce industry has uh, evolved so rapidly in last 10 years uh, i can say i think change is only constant so our mindset is that you know we need to end and since this industry has had a rapid expansion i think the growth rate of this industry has been almost been a chart buster compared to like a lot of other industries in the in the country or or overall other industries so there has been new requirements while there has been a requirement of creating scale as well so so it is so you have to bring in new fresh people because you know your you you sort of push up the capacity by 50 to 60% every year on year on a very large workforce at the same time because the growth is so stupendous you also have to continuously reskill because you know the other people also the existing people also needs to understand how to handle a bigger portfolio or how to do things differently and and there are various phases you know uh, when when cod started i let let me cash on delivery started cash on delivery was a very novel thing now for example even though it's called cash on delivery at the doorstep you can either pay cash you can pay by upi you can pay by any of the wallets we can even have some in some cases you can even swipe your card at the doorstep so that's the evolution the name remains the same that's the evolution that has happened in the industry similarly you know there has been a continuous urge all of you would have realized that speed of e-commerce delivery has continuously has gone up the the delivery time has reduced so you know as a logistics it has had a big role to play in change, changing the speed because as the speed has gone up customer expectation has gone up so how do you respond initially the speed was fulfillment initially the focus was fulfillment from fulfillment the the focus has gone to what are the more services you can create on the doorstep and then that has gone on to how do you delight the customer so it's it's today we measure nps so so you know there are so we need we need to continuously equip and reequip or, or train our people on continuously this multiple aspects because you know if, just if i talk of nps we collect nps over 50000 data points every day each day we get 50000 response on our performance uh, on on the quality parameters so this are humongous numbers so it is about continuously changing continuously skilling reskilling a team which is growing uh where where the numbers are shifting by 50 60% and obviously since these are field jobs there's a there's a, there's a significant amount of churn as well i told covid was 80% but even without covid there's a 10 to 15% churn in the workforce at least at the field level so all those things make training a very important thing for us we use multiple things we use classroom training we use uh, uh, physical uh, we use daily standards we use virtual learning environments we are also thinking of and we are in the process of creating a virtual environment something like a simulator for for people at different levels and so that you know they can actually simulate a parcel delivery uh or they can simulate uh you know managing a center they can simulate we continuously roll out new systems you know a large part of our team are is our engineers in house engineers so so you know there are continuous new systems and processes being rolled out how do we train the people to use as nitya said you know a big focus is when you're dealing with a large workforce how do you make technology both human and easy to use so so you know how do we a make the technology easy for our workforce b but how do we continuously evolve them to train them for example we used to take signatures post covid 
we started asking for otp now when you send the otp in the morning along with the out for delivery message most people when they come to parcel collect the parcel they said i, I don't remember what came in the morning maybe a couple of three parcels are coming i don't remember we devised a mechanism where we can actually re trigger the otp through a sms at the doorstep when the customer is standing in front of you say i've sent it again please check and give me the otp because that is we are we are delivering goods for which people have either paid especially for the prepaid trip the people have get cash and sometimes for delivering iphone x i might be delivering a 1 lakh rupee product at the doorstep i can't go wrong out there so we might be delivering a credit card so so you know as i said like multiple things has to be done and and uh, we we continuously train our people uh, and change is only constant so there are new challenges every day and and what is challenging is you know you are training up blue collar workers who has probably a shorter stint continuously i can imagine that problem uh mightily over to you why don't you share the reskilling strategy you are using in your organization so you know very uh, similar to what sadveer and abita was said but a little different because the it bpm industry itself is different so what we did is first thing we said was during the covid time that our priority is our people so number one is people and their safety number two is protecting our existing customers ensuring that their work gets done and is not disrupted and third which we said we will take a call on was new business so while we set it like that um, we also had to reskill ourselves because we had to work on new age tech solution so what we did was we rolled out a next learn platform uh, organization name is next wealth so next learn platform where we uh, automated the entire lnd learning and development um, you know uh, ecosystem in the ai ml area specifically because that's the area that we do work in so one number one what we did was process related upskilling so here we looked at trained people on analytics insights uh, how to do root cause analysis the yellow belt green belt program and quality so that's the first thing we did on process related skills second we did on competency related skills so here we uh, launched you know ai ml 101s 102s learning management system we tied up with moodle and we had a whole lot of videos that we put up on the 101 102 103 of ai ml and the various areas of you know things like image annotation video annotation lidar semantic semantic segmentation and so on so those were competency related areas that we uh, put up third we what we did was um, we also said that people need to be motivated and really excited about doing this uh, because you know when you put up something and say you know you go online and learn it is not something that people automatically do so we had a gamification or a leaderboard which talked about how much of learning or how much how many of these modules people had done so there was a gamification leaderboard to excite and motivate people and there was very good competition amongst the people to finish as many of these modules as possible fourth thing that we did was we set up a center of excellence for ai uh, because this was a time to do all that and in putting up the center of excellence we had a whole lot of material that we put up that people could actually go and look at and last is we said competency is upskilling and reskilling itself has to have a measurement so we said this is where we started with now these are the things that we have done so where have people moved to i have 3000 people in my organization doing aiml data services so if they started with this what have they moved up to so we had a competency index that we built and we said how much which is called the practice maturity model and we measured that so we started 40% we moved up to 88% by the end of the year and in between all this though we said we are not going to look at new customers we actually grew 100% this year so you know we actually onboard recruit sourced recruited onboarded trained about 1000 people and all this had to be done completely uh, virtually so while we did all this at the same time i think all this is you know outer skills but what about things like the uh, what i call as the outer we did it at three levels outer skills is all of this second layer is the outer slash inner skills which is your customer communication skills ability to do insights negotiation skills leadership skills problem solving skills analytical skills so we had a whole lot of uh, one external speakers second learning systems here and then we had uh, you know role plays made it really exciting for them like a social 
And last is the third layer is actually looking at the inner well-being of the person because COVID has left people really, really scared, uh, especially where we work in the small towns. So we looked at the inner well-being and we rolled out things like a 21-day meditation program, work beyond stress as a module in the, you know, the amount of skilling and training we have done is, I think, equal to what we would have done in the last five years. And personally, as a CEO of the organization, 10% to 15% of my time actually goes in ensuring people are going through all of these uh, trainings and uh, sk- uh, upskilling. And that is the single most important thing, I think, for this industry in the next two years. This is really incredible. You know, the way you have been able to explain comprehensively your learning and development strategy, it appears that you are an LD head. So, you know, uh, it's really remarkable the way l and has become a CEO's uh, interest uh, at this point of time. Absolutely, and yeah. also, uh, it's amazing to hear that, you know, that you're not only teaching them technologies, but also self-care. So it's an overall, you know, betterment of a person that helps the organization to grow. Um, yes, taking a cue from Maithali, I'll go to Sarabveer. And I'll ask you the same question as a CEO. How closely are you working with your L&D head to plan the learning and development strategy in your organization? I think uh, the way we look at uh, learning and development, uh, first of all, we kind of don't use it, think of it as an HR function. And I, and I don't mean any sort of uh, you know, disrespect to HR. We, uh, we combine learning and development actually with the sales team. So our learning and development head reports to our chief operating officer and is at the same level as our sales head. And I genuinely believe that the sales and training function are actually interchangeable. As in a good sales leader should be a good trainer and vice versa. Because what we don't want is that a training person who is not able to sell himself or herself and equally a sales person who is not able to train. Because at the end of the day, the two skills are totally interchangeable and there must be an appreciation of the real work that is required to convince a customer. So on our, uh, from an operations perspective, we give learning and development the same focus as we give sales or service. So the, uh, the people in charge are at the same level. The second thing is that we have created a tailored strategy for each part of the chain. And what I mean by that is, what is one is the input. Who should we hire? Right? What is the qualities that we are looking for? And rather than making it a very esoteric exercise, what we have done is we have seen what are the qualities of our top agents, of the agents who have done well. And we are now trying to, in whatever tests, and as you know, there are lots of tests and you keep trying to look for better and better ones. But we try to measure those qualities. And all we are trying to do is improve the odds of success. Uh, Selling insurance is not for everyone. It's actually quite an acquired skill. Some people are very good at it and some people are just terrible. So we are trying to find those people or improve the odds of that. Second is the first three months after you join us. How are you treated? What kind of opportunities are you given? What kind of feedback are you given? Because again, that's a period where people lose heart. And sometimes, you know, you can lose lose the direction. Then the middle is other people who are doing uh, reasonably well, maybe not great. But how do we keep them motivated? Because see, they are actually the backbone of the company. So the top and the bottom, of course, are important. But the middle is where, you know, a lot of volume is there. So you want to make sure that those people are motivated. Again, slightly different approaches and different strategies. And finally, the top performers. Now, for the top performers, our approach is totally uh, almost custom, uh, I would say, uh, bespoke for them. Which is that we are saying each one of you, so about, let's say, 1,000 of our agents are top performers. Each one of those 1,000 people have access to me. They have access to, you know, anybody in the organization. We try to, you know, address their challenges at an individual level. Uh, we give incentives which are, you know, I would say definitely best in class. Uh, like last year, we gave 10 houses. So the, uh, you know, there was a, uh, for the top, only it was only for the top performers and, you know, 10 people have got a full house each. So we are taking the discussion to a level where we are saying that it is not just about outcome. It is also about the input. What are we doing to train you? I think as, we, as has been discussed, mental health, you know, suggestions around how to conduct yourself during the day. Because remember, these many of these people are very young when they join us. So this is a formative experience for them in terms of how to conduct yourself, how to talk to people, how to, you know, uh, how do you sort of dress? How do you manage your life, manage your day? 
so it's it's an elaborate program where which we are running across uh, these uh, you know uh, these life stages i would say uh, and you know we give like uh, i mean as much importance as is possible and for the of course then for the non operations people uh, there of course it's a more traditional setup uh, where you know we are focused uh, more on making sure that uh, you know the the younger lot are you know are feel as if they are part of the organization and that has been the most difficult in the last i would say one and a half years because you know people have joined remotely they have been working from home uh, it's hard for them to appreciate what is the policy with our culture i mean you know you can read the mission mission and vision but the fact of the matter is that till you meet people and till you see that in action it's it's really hard so we have tried to do that uh, but i'm sure you, as you can tell by my answer i think a lot of our focus is on the operations end uh and uh, to some extent i think uh, the other part we we allow the team leaders etc to drive themselves uh, more than uh, driven centrally very interesting and very valid points sir abhir uh nitya i'd like to go and ask you that um, as a leader as a ceo of your organization how are you walking the talk uh, how are you showing your workforce that you are also equally upskilling yourself So, how are you investing in your learning? I think that's a great question, and um, you know, as a as a founder and CEO, first time CEO of a company, um, learning and evolving yourself is is the biggest challenge, and and a, and a, and the most incredible journey, and and actually the most satisfying journey, uh, I think I have taken, and and this is about learning new skills at the same time learning. how to create an organization manage people motivate people keep them learning and and be aligned on one vision and mission uh you know when you start a startup like we did it's five people in a room it seems very easy and then five people become 25 25 become 50 and as you scale from 25 to 50 50 to 100 things start changing uh and if you're not deliberate as a leader about managing that change being very aware about the change is about to happen and 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 how do we think about it uh you can completely you know uh things can go very wrong um so what i have i have tried to do on my end personally is uh it becomes in the end a lot more psychological and mental than any any relevant hard skill and just keeping yourself you know surrounding yourself with the right team uh having the right org structure uh which is again no one tells you that you never know this before you just learn you make a lot, lot of mistakes and then you kind of like improvise uh and one thing that i have really tried to do it myself and then i've tried to enthuse in our company is in the end any company especially an early stage startup is an inventor every everybody's job at at our company is is that of invention which means you have to have three things one you have to be very very intellectually curious then you have to take high amount of ownership to be problem solvers critical thinkers and think on behalf of the customer and just do stuff um so invent and then third is is it's okay to make mistakes as long as you are not making the same mistakes again and again it's totally okay to make mistakes and 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 what i'm trying to do for myself and for the company is build a culture so that learning is okay and learning learning on the job and by doing things as opposed to training per se is is uh, you know the fastest way to learn and it's okay to make mistakes it's okay to take a bet uh, it's okay to um, you know do something that may not be very conventional and i think i felt at least for myself for sure that is the fastest way to learn i also read a lot and i try to read topics that are slightly broad in nature so that over time i can connect the dots uh, i've always felt that sometimes when you read a broad range of topics it may not add up and connect the dots in 6 months but it does in 6 years or 10 years uh, so you know that's kind of like how i try to upskill myself and keep on keep keep the game on thank you nitya for that and i totally agree you know one thing that we've learned from the success of startups in the last you know 8 to 10 years is that um, Uh, being an explorer and being an entrepreneur these two kind of skills is what even you know the bigger organizations want their employees to foster because that will keep the innovation process going on uh, amita i'd like to go to you and ask you uh, what kind of metrics are you following to assess your lnd strategy and how do you keep it connected to your business outcome 
Pooja, the usual ones, you know, we measure, we, we set ourselves a set of business goals, uh, you know, other than the normal basic trainings that you know, everybody has to go through. Any training that we formalize, we, we have we have our business goals. We continuously, we do daily monitoring. As a practice, we do, we run a lot of analytics and we do daily monitoring for business functions. And post-training, we, we look at specifically for a location of a set of people, how those numbers change continuously. So that's that's the that's one metric that is that that we look at. Uh, other than that, we we also look at overall you know amount of change in the overall matrices that we have been able to bring because a change, as I said, there's a continuous change that's happening. So there's a lot of change management training. So be it on a simple workforce practices, be it on a technology, be it on anything else. So another thing is, you know, how quickly are we able to adapt or roll out new new practices, new processes, new new tools uh, or new apps, new features. So that's another measure. And third is, are we able to reduce error rates, defects? Are we able to increase the quality overall? Are we able to get uh, you know better customer response? So these are the three sets. One is a direct measurement. One is a change management or upskilling, and the third is you know uh, slightly higher order uh, measures of you know the customer satisfaction goals and 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 things like that. Very valid points, um, sir. We one closing note from you. I think from my side, uh, I'm a. I'm glad that you are you're having this discussion. I think uh, this is a subject which probably deserves a lot more uh, discussion than it normally gets, uh, especially I think at a senior level, I think it's very important. I think you use the term, you know, uh, walk the talk. And I think that's uh, really very important because if, you know, if the organization doesn't see, uh, I feel everything finally comes down to the seen behavior rather than the said behavior, right? And so I think it's really important that, uh, you know, uh, leaders are seen making the time because there is always a temptation, you know, to, to say that, you know, there are other more important things to be done. Uh, so, you know, those are all sort of uh, urgent but not important in my opinion and I think uh, it's really uh, critical to do that uh, you know we are all at the end of the day as good as the people in our organizations really that is our core asset right we, we have no machinery no equipment nothing that we are doing uh, otherwise uh, and I think uh, whatever we can do uh, to sort of one is I think you no know, one view of training in my opinion is just very functional stuff but actually you know people now uh, are searching for meaning, right? And I, and I honestly believe that is true, right? I mean, it's, this is a discussion that we have many times that people are searching for meaning. And I think it's really important to provide that meaning through uh, skilling, through joy they, they can derive from the work that they do. Um, all of us spend the most amount of time at work. So the joy that we can derive from that is really critical. And uh, I think this, this learning and development is really towards that goal rather than just, just the basic, you know, ideas of, creating more business, etc. Uh, because if we can have more involved people, we have you know people who are finding meaning in what they're doing. Uh, I think we'll, we'll all be much better off. Very true. Uh, Maithali, one closing note from you. Yeah, so like uh, Sarvit rightly said, from her IT BPM industry point of view, I think the number one priority for CEOs here is the learning and development and skilling of the people and moving them up the uh, competency value chain. I would put that as a number one priority, even before the financials. Um, that is point number one. Uh, second is point number two is, um, you know, as we talked about joy of doing the work, I think that's so important. Uh, in our organization, we focus on people being happy coming into work. In fact, this year we are measuring the happiness index of people. So it's not only about skilling, which is related to work. It is also, as I said earlier, about the inner well-being and are they happy coming into work? So as a CEO, my number one priority is learning and development and uh, skilling people, helping them. That's the investment that will help to, you know, uh, bear fruits for the organization the next two years. And second is ensuring that we have happy people working in the organization. If you do both of this, I don't think you'll have any attrition. Very true. Um, Nitya, one last point from you. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, as I, I think about it and as I think about um, where our company is today and then where we might be in two years, which could be much bigger organization, uh, one thing that we try our best to instill is uh, a culture of learning, a culture of uh, 
experimenting, a culture of being curious, and a culture of okay to fail. Uh, and I think, um, and of course, supplement that that by some more tangible things. But I think um, hopefully, as long as we can truly instill that and actually demonstrate through leadership that this is how uh, uh, these these are the values of the company, I believe we should be able to. um hire people who are curious and inventors and innovators and 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 wanting are okay okay with experimenting and are ready to take the risk uh, at the same time provide them the the fertile ground where they can do that and and therefore learn and teach others yes i like the way you said provide them the fertile ground because that's very important you know to give them the free hand to make mistakes and then pull up their socks and learn so with that we come and come to an end of this very wonderful uh, round table session thank you panelists for joining in in this future skill conference i'm really thankful to you from the entire ethr world team so i'll end this uh, panel uh, concluding while learning has always been about improving today it has become a business imperative as talent takes center stage in organizations at present skilling prepares a workforce to quickly adapt to ever changing business needs in other words make them more agile and resilient and problem solving are these essential human skills to succeed in the hybrid workplace thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you